Hi, my name is Ben Justice. I'm a percussionist and a composer and educator from Gunnison, Colorado. And today I'm here in Glacier National Park in the Artist in Residence cabin. Today we're making a recording of my outreach presentation on the current Artist in Residence here in the park. And it's been a real treat to be up here for the last few weeks working on projects for the park. Uh, today I want to talk a little bit about the Artist in Residence program in general and talk about some of my projects and then do some performing on this beautiful instrument that you see here behind me. Normally when the artist in residence comes up to the park, they're gonna do a few public outreach presentations that are well done outside, usually in public, or maybe in one of the visitor centers or an education center. Uh, right now, it's the end of July in 2020, and there's currently a worldwide pandemic going on caused by the novel coronavirus, and the US has been particularly hard hit. So. It's in everybody's best interest that we try and minimize mass gatherings. So unfortunately this year, uh, it's not possible to do those public presentations. So that's why we're filming today. You'll also notice that I've got a mask on. That's really to keep myself and our awesome film crew here safe during this presentation. So a little bit about the artists in residence programs and why parks have artists in residence programs. Well, really going back to the late 1800s, painters were making really beautiful art of Western environments and landscapes and sending a lot of that artwork back out east to where a lot of the policymakers were to try and influence and uh, help gain knowledge of these really beautiful places out west with the goal of preserving them. And so there's this really large lineage, this really long lineage of people who've created works for the national parks on their behalf there. If you think of, uh, say, photographers like Ansel Adams, who did a lot of work in Yosemite and in many, many national parks, that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about there, where we have an artist trying to depict um, a sort of landscape or an environment really to raise awareness of these really, really beautiful places out there. So there is a historical precedent for having artists in the parks. And also, art is one, a really, really great way to get the park missions and their interpretive themes out into the public and get it seen and heard and experienced by lots of people, particularly young people there. So it has this, uh, it really has this goal of trying to shine a light on these places and make people aware of these places, both for um, sustaining visitorship and also sus um, sustaining advocacy for these places as well. Uh, a little bit about the particular projects that I'm going to be working on while I'm here. Um, as a composer, really my goal is to try and create a uh, piece of music for the park here. And so that can be a work for an acoustic ensemble, or it could be an entirely electric work. It could be a combination of both. It really depends on a lot of different factors that I'll uh, talk about later. There. But a lot of my projects that I've been undertaking while I'm here have been um, doing uh, field recordings of the park to really try and put something that's specific uh, to the park with this piece of music. So I've been going out and taking hikes with this right here. This is my uh, high definition digital recorder that I've been taking out on hikes and capturing sounds of everything from um, grouses that I've seen on the trail and varied thrushes up near Avalanche Lake and glacial runoff coming on coming down from waterfalls and uh, maybe my favorite sound so far is that on the trail up to Howe Lake there are all these burned trees because it's been in a burn area and as the wind blows in a particular direction it passes through these these husks of these burned out trees and creates this really haunting whistling sound that hits these different harmonics. It's, yeah, it's very, very, uh, it's very spooky. It's a very, very interesting sound. And so I'm really collecting these sounds because I might use them in a piece, but I also might use these as like an inspiration, as a sort of, um, a, like a sonic memento to take with me if I'm working for uh, an acoustic ensemble, like an orchestra or a concert band or something like that. I can go back and listen to these pieces to maybe help with writer's block or gain inspiration and put myself back in the past when I was actually in residence here. Um, so it's been really, really wonderful to be here. This cabin is absolutely beautiful. It's a really inspiring place to work. Uh, the artist in residence process in terms of uh, being awarded a residency is a little bit like writing a grant. You typically have a proposal that you write and say, here's the project that I'm hoping to, to create or I want to do uh, a piece in the style of X, Y, or Z, and here are the specific tasks that I'm hoping to complete within the, the park 
while you're in residence, and also what your public presentations might look like and what's the feasibility of doing those, what kinds of support are you going to need from the park, and what can you do to share that park's well, beauty and the interpretive themes and the missions of that park with a really, really wide audience. For composing, it gets a little bit tricky because it's very, uh, it's very, very abstract as opposed to maybe a landscape painter who can do a really, really exquisite rendering of Lake McDonald or um, any number of the really, really gorgeous places that are here in the park. With audio, it's much, much more abstract. Unless you've got program notes or some sort of other explanation, it's kind of hard to connect these things and make something that's identifiable to a particular park. Um, and so for me, this might mean taking the recordings and making a collage out of them, or taking the recordings and splicing them and adding audio effects to make a much more complex aggregate work from them. It might mean just making the recordings and using them as inspiration for an acoustic piece, because with composition, if you're writing for other people, well, you're reliant on having groups to work with at the time that you want to have that performance. So in a few months, the project might evolve and say, I might say like, hey, I have an opportunity to work with a really dynamite choir. I actually want to take my piece and pivot it so that I can have the greatest outreach and the greatest, um, and really reach the most, the most people I can with a particular work, depending on who's available and who can perform with that particular piece there. Um, so that's a little bit about the project I'm undertaking here. Um, my ultimate goal is either with using the, the recordings or uh, in a lot of different forms, either slicing them up into smaller parts or by using them wholesale, maybe as part of a collage to try and create the best art I can to really uh, raise awareness of all the really beautiful things going on in this park. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about this enormous thing that's behind me. This is a marimba, and so I'm a percussionist, and so this is one of the main instruments that I perform on, and I was really lucky to be able to bring this instrument up here and to rearrange the furniture in the space to get it to fit. Um, as a performer, I need to try and keep my hands in shape as best I can, so it's been great to be able to be in this beautiful setting and practice and to be able to present for all of you. So I want to play a few uh, snippets of pieces and then some, in, uh, some whole pieces for you, but um, the instrument is comprised of a bunch of different parts. We have these big wooden slats on top. These are called the bars. These are made out of Honduran rosewood, which is really like the ideal substance to make these bars out of. It's a really uh, very dense, slow growing wood. And so it takes a long time to harvest an adequate amount to make an instrument like this because it uses a lot of that rosewood. You'll also notice that it's got these really big tubes hanging down on the bottom here. These are called resonators. And so these are actually stopped. They're not all hollow. They have little, uh, little caps in them. And so the length of the air column is roughly the same frequency as the bar above it. And what that does is it gives the instrument a lot more depth of sound. It gives it more volume, and it gives it a much longer ring as well. Uh, you're probably thinking, well, it just looks like a really, really gigantic xylophone. And in a lot of ways, it is kind of a gigantic xylophone. The bar shape is different. For instance, the bars get uh, wider as they go down the instrument, and most xylophones don't get that much wider as the bars increase in size. It also has much, much larger resonators and a much lower range as well. The marimba doesn't go as high as the xylophone, but it goes much, 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 much lower. So this is a five octave model, which has become uh, the most common size for professional instruments. And so the very lowest note is the C below the bass clef staff, a pretty low note. And then we've got another octave of C's, octave two, three, four, and then the last one, five, up here. So if you wanted to play the two highest C's on the instrument, you would really have to bend over in order to play those and probably have kind of long arms to be able to hit those as well. Instrument with a really, really big range that allows us to play a lot of different solo pieces and even cover works by other instruments, which I'll, uh, I'll talk about uh, a little bit later. Uh, I really, really love this instrument because of the vast array of expressivity that it has. This instrument can roar, it can whisper, it can be very aggressive, it can be very somber, and it can do pretty much everything in between as well. Uh, the layout of the instrument is very, very similar to piano, where you've got like the black keys or the accidentals, the sharps and the flats up here in this row, 
And then down, closer to the performer, and a little bit lower are the natural notes down here. So play it out really just like piano. So to illustrate some of the different characters of the instrument, I want to play just a few snippets for you. So if we wanted to think of the instruments more, um, oh gosh, kind of more lush and contemplative side, here's a little snippet from opening by Philip Glass, which is originally for piano, but it works really, really well for marimba. triplets up here. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And these patterns interlock with the hands. And that triplet and eighth note pattern lasts for the entire piece. It goes on the whole time. And so really the, uh, the rhythmic techniques at work are very, very minimal, minimalism, but we're moving around different chords and different patterns with the notes there. So that's an example of the, the softer, a little bit more delicate side of the instrument. It can also really be very, very aggressive as well. Here's the beginning of a uh, of rhythm song by Paul Smadbeck. <laughs> using a different set of mallets as well. These are a little bit harder mallets. I wanted to show you what these look like. Most mallets are built in a pretty similar way. You've got this long stick part, which we generally call the shaft of the mallet. This is usually made of something like birch or maple. These are very, very kind of rigid mallets. They don't really, um, they don't have much flex to them. These, which I use more for instruments like vibraphone, sometimes xylophone, made of rattan, so they're very, very bendy there. But at the end of the mallet, we've got the mallet head here. This is usually yarn, sometimes cord or a synthetic yarn. This is actually a wool yarn. And then if we were to slice all this off, you would see a little rubber core on the inside there. Uh, you're probably noticing that sometimes I'm holding four mallets, and that really allows a marimbus to play things like chords or things like permutations, which are these patterns of, of uh, different mallet combinations as they move around. So, if say you've got some chopsticks or some spoons at home and you want to try this out, if you wanted to hold four mallets, you would hold it kind of like this. You do kind of separate your hands like that, kind of live long and prosper. And then, grab this outer mallet with your fingers like that. And then your inner mallet, you're going to hold it in the center of your hand with your middle finger and then wrap your thumb and your index finger around. If you keep your thumb flat, there you should be able to roll that inside mallet or chopstick or spoon or whatever you're using there at home around like that. So if you needed to play uh, a really close interval, like notes that are right next to each other, you can move your thumb in and then you can separate them out if you needed to play a really big interval like that. So that's kind of the general way uh, you can hold four mallets. That's one way to do it. There are some other grips as well that uh, different marimbas will use, or sometimes even switch grips for different pieces. Um, so I mentioned, I kind of alluded that the instrument, well, is really, really quite large, obviously. And one of the reasons it's gotten so big is that composers have written more and more music for this instrument. There's been a lot more serious solo music written for, and composers, well, they want more notes to work with, especially in the lower range of the instrument. And this is about as big as this instrument gets. You can find uh, models that have a few extra notes on the high end, though those are fairly rare. Um, another one of the reasons why the instrument has been expanded is that we really like to cover music by different instruments, especially the cello. Uh, the cello has a sort of similar timbre. It's this really lush, resonant sound, and the instrument has been expanded to that really low C because if you play on the very lowest string of the cello, it's that same note, it's that same low C, which means that we can play just about any music that a cello can play, with some exceptions when we get into things like extended techniques that 
Uh, the cello can do, the marimba can't, though the marimba can do a few things that the cello can't. For example, play simultaneous four note chords. It's possible to do on the cello, but it's very, very difficult to get all four strings at once there. And so, this is one of my favorite pieces. This is originally for cello, but it works really, really, really well on marimba. This is the jig from box third cello suite in C. on it pertaining to expressivity. It doesn't have any dynamic markings, which tell you how loud or how soft to play. It doesn't really have any phrase markings or anything that says to push or pull at the tempo at all. So, if you play it exactly as written, and if you use some harder mallets, you can make it sound not great. <laughs> and the rhythms are technically correct there, but it's very digitized and very computerized sounding. You can also way, way, way over express and make it sound bizarre too. <laughs> These things like that that just really will throw the audience off. So finding a middle ground is one of the things that's really, really fun about playing music like this where you don't get a whole lot of information provided for you. So it's really enjoyable to listen to different cellists like Yo-Yo Ma or Rostropovich or Pablo Casals or Matt Heimovitz and say, okay, maybe I want to try this phrase like this cellist, but ooh, do this phrase like this cellist, and then do my own thing for this phrase down here. It's something that's really, really fun. So that's an example of a, a two mallet piece. I want to play a little four mallet piece for you and illustrate how we can use mallet combinations to play some really, really interesting patterns. So I'm going to hold four for this one. This is a concert etude I wrote 10-ish uh, years ago, and it uses this pattern of one, two, three, two, three, four. We number the mallets one, two, three, four, left to right from the perspective of the performers. It's one, two, three, two, three, four, one, two, three, two, three, four, over and over again. That. So it's basically using this technique um, in a musical way and moving it around in different chords to make a piece, you could say play on a concert or a recital, that was really meant to use this particular technique and work on this certain skill. So here's that concert etude.
thanks so much for listening. If you're interested in some other projects I'm working on, I'll put a link to my website in the description, as well as some links to learn more about the Artists in Residence programs at the National Parks. Thank you very much.